Hi, this is Saki Brahman from the OrthoClips podcast series. And today's episode is going to be on subtrochanteric femur fractures in adults, top five management tips. So this is an important uh, topic to discuss. Um, subtrochanteric femur fractures can cause trouble for the surgeons taking care of them. Uh, if you're on call and you get a hip fracture and you realize it's stable inner troch and just needs a closed reduction and sliding hip screw or a nail, you know it's going to be relatively straightforward, at least technically in the operating room. Uh, but when you get a subtrochanteric femur fracture, you know there's going to be a little bit of a struggle. You know there's potential for uh, perhaps a worse outcome. So uh, it's important to get the management right and to understand how can you better set yourself up for success. So tip number one, be prepared to do an open reduction, okay? It doesn't mean you always have to do an open reduction, but you have to be prepared. So how are you prepared? Well, understand what techniques you might have to perform, know what you have at your disposal and what you might need to call in, right? So it's pre-op planning, right? So it's thinking about what are you gonna need and how do you make sure you have it readily available do you need bone forceps? What type of bone forceps do you need? Do you need the right retractors to be able to visualize if you need to do an open reduction? What kind of assistance do you have? Uh, keep in mind, this is a fracture that you may not be able to, and in many cases will not be able to get a closed reduction on uh, no matter how hard you pull. So be prepared to do an open reduction. Have what you need. Uh, be set up so that um, you can achieve that. And it's uh, it sounds easy. And when you actually get in there to do it, uh, it can be a bit of a struggle. Uh, but what you don't want to have happen is um, uh, realize that uh, you don't even have what you need to, to properly accomplish it and you're just using the wrong tools. So number two, consider piriformis entry nailing. So I think this is something that um, really keeps you out of trouble. Why? Well, because subtrochanteric femur fractures are prone to go into varus, right? So if you're prone to go into varus, if you start with a greater trochanteric start point, it is generally harder to keep your instruments in a straight line going down. And what the tendency can be is you start at the greater trochanter and you aim from lateral to medial, and if there's any kind of medial comminution, you're setting yourself up for varus. Now, of course, trochanteric entry nails often have a bow, but sometimes that just may not be enough. Uh, and now you're finding yourself having to do blocking screws or hopefully not accepting a varus malreduction. That can be very disabling. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of the trochanteric start nails um, – are marketed towards uh, or marketed as a solution for subtrochanteric femur fractures. And I'm not saying they're not, but I'm saying that you should really consider, I mean, when I see a subtroch fracture, I'm immediately thinking, can I treat this with a piriformis start nail, some type of recon nail that has screws up into the head, for instance, if I need that. But I like that straight shot. It keeps me out of varus. I have to do less uh, blocking screws and other techniques to avoid malreduction. All right, so that's number two. So number one, pre-prepare to do an open reduction. Number two, consider piriformis entry nailing. Number three, get comfortable with both supine and lateral positioning, okay? Now, this is where um, a lot of surgeons feel very strongly one way or the other, um, some people say, oh, I always do these in a lateral position or I always do them supine or I use a free leg position or sloppy lateral position. Of course, there's a lot of ways to do it, but that's the point. I think you should be comfortable with both supine and lateral positioning. Why? Because each has their advantages and you may be in a situation where um, one option really works better and you're forcing yourself to do a supine nailing, for instance, when clearly this is going to be a better case for lateral. So a couple of instances where I think there's advantages and disadvantages. So number one, 
I think supine is a little bit easier to avoid malrotation. Why? Well, because if you can keep the pelvis level and you have the knees pointing straight and the feet pointing straight and um, you perform your nail, you're in a little bit of a better situation to avoid malreduction as opposed to if you're lateral and the patient's rolling over and you can't really assess and you can't really um, see how you can compare to the other leg. Imaging is a little bit tricky. Um, So supine may be preferable. Lateral, definitely preferable for getting your start point. Definitely preferable if you plan to open. So if you know that this is a fracture, you're going to have to open and you know that right off the bat. Let's say if it's a if it's a case that you know you're going to plate, right? Let's say you're going to be doing a proximal femoral locked plate or a blade plate or something like that. If I know I'm absolutely going to be plating a case, uh, I will go lateral. Why? Well, because the soft tissue dissection is much easier. The tissues fall away from you. You're not fighting this massive muscle and soft tissue falling down with gravity into your field standing, uh, looking sideways into the wound. Um, it's like you're doing uh, a normal case uh, in the patient in the lateral position, tissues falling away, and you can uh, get much better access to the uh, femur fracture and uh, instrument it as you need. Um, like I said, the starting point's easier if you're going to be nailing it. The bone is right there if you're going to be plating it. So get comfortable with both supine and lateral positioning. There's a there's going to be a case where uh, you may have to go a little bit out of your comfort zone, but you're going to find that the, the the alternate positioning is going to facilitate a better outcome for you. All right, that was number three. Number four, don't get peer pressured into avoiding cables. Now, I say this because I've been to a lot of meetings and courses where people get up there and say, like, cabling is the worst thing in the world. They draw pictures of these blood vessels running up and down uh, along the femur, getting strangulated when you put a cable around it, and all of a sudden the whole bone dies. I mean, come on, that's not exactly how it works. Okay, cables are are a uh, reduction tool. They're a fixation device that can work very well in many cases if you're in there already open and reducing a fracture and you've got clamps on there and you've got a great reduction, do you really want to watch that thing gap open two, three, four centimeters if you have this big, long posterior medial fragment that's perhaps a butterfly and it's floating there? Do you really want to have that thing grossly displaced just so you don't have to have a cable on your x-ray? Or would you rather cable that, get better compression, improve your fracture healing. There's nothing wrong with cabling some of these. If you're already in there and you're already open, you're not killing the bone by using a a cable passer and a cable, all right? So sometimes I think it can be a nice tool uh, that uh, can help with some of these subtroke fractures, especially if you have these long posterior medial butterfly fragments. All right, that's number four. Number five, be aware of malrotation and avoid it. Of course, be aware of malrotation. So you can say this with any nailing case, right? It's just in subtrochanteric femur fractures, sometimes you can get um, a little bit caught up in, you know, struggling, getting the reduction, and you finally get it and you put the nail in. And especially if you're in an alternate position, like if you're in a lateral position, you really have to be obsessive. I guess you could say this about um, you know, femoral shaft fractures as well, but just remember at the end of the case, check your rotation on a flat table. Don't wait until that patient goes up to their room and they're in their bed and now you can't tell because they're turned one way or the other, other and the, the head of the bed is flexed up. Check it while they're asleep on the OR table. You can um, slide the gown off. You can really check both limbs, make sure you have equivalent rotation. And if it's not equivalent, you can address it while you're still in the OR under anesthesia, rather than having to explain to the patient why you have to bring them back. All right. So you really have to be obsessive about this. And obviously you don't want to end up at the end of the case in a situation like that. Have some methods. I'm not going to describe all of them. It's a little bit hard in an audio podcast to really go through that, but have a good technique and method to assess rotation radiographically 
be able to have some physical exam uh, findings that you can also correlate with. So when you take the drapes down, you can be a little bit confident. So just reiterate those five tips again. Number one, and again, this is subtrochanteric femur fractures in adults. Top five management tips. Number one, be prepared to do an open reduction. Number two, consider piriformis entry nailing. Number three, get comfortable with both supine and lateral positioning. Number four, don't get peer pressure into avoiding cables if you really need one. Number five, be aware of malrotation and avoid it. So I hope you find those uh, five tips helpful. Feel free to leave comments and see you at the next episode. Thanks.